G'day and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and I am absolutely thrilled to have Carlo Broussard on the show today. And when I invite him up in a minute, he's going to tell me if I ought to pronounce it Broussard or Broussard. And that's going to be fantastic. And then we're going to talk about purgatory, everything you've ever wanted to know about purgatory. Carlo and I will chat for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions from our patrons and super chatters. I hope we've got some Protestants here who, and maybe others who disagree with purgatory, think it's unbiblical, would like some clarification. Obviously, totally open to pushback and objections or whatever else. Um, before I invite Carlo up, a couple of things I want to say. We've had a bunch of people asking where they can get this Pints with Aquinas focus. Focus, focus, Beerstein. Come on. No, it's not going to do it. Pints with Aquinas Beerstein. The only way, there you go. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. The only way you can get this Pints with Aquinas Beerstein is by becoming a patron. You can't just buy it. It's like a super inside club kind of thing. Uh, we do a ton of stuff over at patreon.com slash Uh One of the things we are about to do, which I am really excited about, is uh, we're about to do a new five-part series on salvation history with Dr. Andrew Swafford beginning in early January. We've done different courses on Augustine's Confessions, the great books of Western civilization, Dante. We did a course on Flannery O'Connor and Thomas Aquinas. But this one will be held by Dr. Andrew Swafford. And he will be not only recording videos for my patrons, he'll also be in the comments section and chatting with all y'all. So in order to get ready for this, it'd be a great way to kick off the new year. Go to patreon.com slash mattfrad, become a patron. You'll get access to all that stuff and beer steins and books and stuff sent to your door. And that'll be bloody lovely. All right. Good. Carlo Prasad, lovely to have you on the show. Matt, it's lovely to be on the show, brother. <laughs> Glad to have you on. I just had somebody in the chat say they're so pumped. They said they apparently have been telling me in the comments sections for a long time right now, you have to have Carlo on the show. I didn't see that, but you are on the show. And so now it looks like Here I listen to my subscribers, which is awesome. Yeah, well, <laughs> well thanks for having me, brother. It, it's an honor to be on with you, man. Good. Okay. And then you've got a book that just came out, which uh, I'm so glad you wrote on purgatory. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the title is Purgatory is for Real. I guess kind of a rip off of heaven is for real type of thing. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the subtitle is good news about the afterlife for those who aren't perfect yet. So the main title and the subtitle sort of encapsulates and represents the sort of two pronged approach of the book. I want to try to give some evidence for mm -hmm. the church's teaching that purgatory is real in contrast to those who would deny it. And also, too, to try and reclaim or emphasize perhaps uh, some good news about purgatory. You know, there is a, a charge against the doctrine of purgatory that because it entails all of this torment and suffering and punishment yeah. that is contrary to the joy that's appropriate to the Christian and in, in the Christian life and being a member of or a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so it's, that second part is sort of an, an apology or a response to that charge but at the same time, it also offers a pastoral aspect of the doctrine for us as Catholics, right? Because there are certain joyful truths, Matt, that constitute the good news about purgatory. So as I point out in the book, uh, one joyful truth is that it provides consolation for believers. It inspires the pursuit of holiness in this life. And then there are certain joys bound up with the reality of purgatory that go beyond the joys of this life. And I think it's important that we talk about the joys bound up with the purgatorial experience in order to provide a, an appropriate context, perhaps, uh, for us to emphasize and talk about the suffering entailed in purgatory. Because it is true, Matt, in the tradition, you do have an emphasis on the suffering of purgatory and the intense mm -hmm. nature of that suffering, but almost to an eclipse of the joys entailed in purgatory. And so what I wanted to do in my book is to try to just highlight those two aspects. Rather than being one, rather than one eclipsing the other, I wanted to highlight both because it's a part of the tradition, it's a part of our faith, and I think it's important that we highlight and present both aspects of okay. the reality uh, in order not to lose the full picture there. Well, let me, thanks. Let me show folks what this looks like. I have it up on the screen right now. Purgaty, it's purgaty. Purgatory is for real. Good news about the afterlife for those who aren't perfect yet. So uh, in the description below, there is a link to this book. I hope you will check it out. But we also have some good news. We're going to be giving away 10 free copies of this book. 
how do you get those 10 free copies? All you got to do is subscribe to this channel. We have what, 96 some 96,000 plus subscribers right now. And so really excited, obviously, to hit that 100,000 subscriber mark. So be sure to subscribe, leave a comment below. And if you do, we'll let you know in the coming week, if you've won the book, and how to how to get that how to claim that free copy of Carlo's new book. All right, uh, this is cool. Okay, why don't we begin in a kind of strange way? Why don't you make the case against purgatory for me? Give me the best arguments, or just maybe sum up an argument against purgatory that you often hear, and put it in the best possible way you can in very Saint Thomas fashion before we start to respond. Yeah, so interesting approach, uh, Matt. I <laughs> wish you had to prep me on it. No, yeah, joking. yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's sort of a, it's sort of, it's not too difficult of uh, a question to answer, but at the same time, it is a bit difficult because it all depends on which aspect of the final purification do you reject, right? Do Which aspect of the final purification do, do I want to construct an argument against? So... Let's say probably the most popular objection to the reality of purgatory, or at least a particular aspect of the reality of purgatory, is an objection to the discharge of the remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin. And many of our Protestant brothers and sisters will construct an argument that says, well, to assert that a Christian who is initially justified has to undergo some suffering on account of past forgiven sins in some way takes away from the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And of course, what's driving that objection is that is the belief that Jesus's death on the cross, number one, is sufficient to take care of all punishment due to sin, both eternal and temporal, and that God has willed in order of providence such that once a Christian has the merits of Jesus's death on the cross applied to his or her soul, subsequent to that initial justification, the Christian no longer incurs any debt of sin, right. whether eternal or temporal, because it's already been taken care of initially with the appropriation of the merits of Jesus's death on the cross. So, so the Protestant and, would say you're cheapening the cross. That's right. And, and you're, so, you're bringing our works into our salvation when it's Christ who's done the work. That's That's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, and, and so the, the argument is that the idea of a, a Christian having to undergo suffering on account of sins, whether in this life or in the afterlife, takes away from the sufficiency of Jesus' death on the cross. In that framework of justification or soteriology in general, there is no room for purgatory. So what I do okay. in the book is I try to articulate, listen, from a Catholic's perspective, that would only be true if we were saying purgatory is necessary because Jesus's death is not sufficient or powerful enough to take away all debt of sin. Mm. But that's not the case. That's not what the church teaches. In fact, Matt, the church teaches, um, if my memory serves me correctly, paragraph 411 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, St. Thomas Aquinas was very uh, clear on this issue that Jesus's death is sufficient to take away all debt of sin, both eternal and temporal. And right. in fact, the church teaches that happens initially in the sacrament of baptism. So the question becomes, well, what is God's order of providence concerning mm. sins subsequent to baptism? Did God will an order of providence such that once a Christian becomes a Christian and is initially justified, no debt of sin whatsoever, or perhaps an order of providence where a Christian receives the full application of the merits of Jesus' death on the cross initially, where all debt of sin is removed, both eternal and temporal, and that subsequent to baptism, a Christian could still incur a debt of temporal punishment due for sin. So which so the, order of providence did God set up? That's the fundamental question. That That's Paul really answered. helpful. So what you're saying is the question isn't what is Christ's death and resurrection capable of? Correct. The question is how has God willed it to be applied to us such, so that we can be saved? Because I suppose— That's right. You know, uh, someone could say, like, uh, say a, a Protestant who believes the unbiblical doctrine of universalism could say to a Protestant who believes in the biblical doctrine of hell, you're really downplaying the cross. I mean, if you really believed in the power of the cross, you would accept the fact that Christ's death and resurrection saves all, even including right. the demons. 
And the Protestant who believes in the biblical doctrine of hell would rightly say that's not at all the case. I mean, yes, it's possible that God would will that, but he hasn't. And we have to be faithful to what he has willed, not what we think we can deduce from the power of the cross and resurrection. That's right. Matt, that brother, that was an amazing insight and parallel because in the discussions on predestination and reprobation, right, we as Catholics affirm, at least from those who are trained in the Thomist tradition, that God could have willed an order of providence where he gave every human being the graces that he gave to the Blessed Virgin Mary in order to ensure infallibly that everyone achieves the beatific vision, right? And that's a possible order of providence. But the question is, that's not the question. The question is, which order of providence did God will? The same applies concerning the application of the merits of Jesus' death on the cross. And so as I argue in my book, I argue for that order of providence where God does will that initially justified Christians still incur a debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin, and that debt is discharged through the imposition of a form of suffering. And Hebrews 12, 5 through 6 is sort of the key go-to text for that, where I give an exegesis of that text in the book. Okay, that's excellent. All right, well, that's good. I think we've laid that out pretty well. And for those who are watching right now who are of the Protestant tradition and, and maybe other traditions, you know, we love you. You're so welcome here. And, and we'd love to hear your thoughts below in the comment section or if you're watching live to share it live right now. But I think the Protestant still says, okay, but wh- where? how is it based biblically? So like, even if you can come up with some sort of logic, w- w- show, us, show us from Scripture. W- what's your response to that? Well, I mean, you could provide an argument by way of inference from certain revealed principles as I do in one of the chapters in my book. So you establish That's these revealed yeah. you you establish these revealed principles. So for example, we have the principle that sin does incur defilement on the soul, 2 Corinthians 7 1. You have the principle that sin does incur a debt of temporal punishment due for sin, Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. And you take all the, and then also you have the revealed principle that no defilement can enter into heaven, mm-hmm. Revelation 21, 27. And whenever you look at these principles, what you come to discover is that it's possible for a Christian to die in friendship with Jesus, but yet still have defilement on the soul. Now, another principle that's operating on is the reality of venial sin, that it's possible to be rightly ordered to God as your life's ultimate end but still have defilement on the soul because of an inordinate turning to a created good without turning away from God as your life's ultimate end, as your ultimate goal. That's called a venial sin. So if it's possible that for a Christian, if it's possible for a soul to be in friendship with Jesus subsequent to death, but yet still have defilement on the soul, well, then it would be necessary for that defilement to be purified or purged before entrance into the, into the beatific vision, based upon these revealed principles. Mm. We do see evidence in the Bible that it's possible for an individual to die in friendship with Jesus, but yet still have some defilement on the soul in light of um, venial sin and incurring of debt of temporal punishment due for sin, the likelihood of dying with such imperfections. Therefore, the conclusion would be such a soul would have to undergo a final purification to remove this defilement, these impediment, these remnants of sin, these vestiges of sin mm. in order to enter into the beatific vision on condition that such remnants of sin are not taken care of completely at death, which it is possible, as I point out in the book, the church teaches, paragraph 1472 in the Catechism, that it's possible for someone to die with such a fervent degree of charity that there would be no remnants of sin left over such that it would the soul would need a final purification before entrance into the beatific vision. So that's one way you could approach it, Matt. Yeah. And then, of course, I provide some evidence from Jesus' teaching Matthew 5, 25 through 26. Yeah, elucidate that Matthew for us, 12. for those who aren't familiar with those verses. If you yeah, know. so Matthew, Matthew 5, 25 through 26, that's where Jesus teaches that, you know, before you present your offering at the altar, you need to go and reconcile with your brother. If you don't, eventually you're going to be thrown into prison. You're not going to get out until you pay the last penny, the last farthing. In Greek, they're the last chondrontes, which is less present, less than 2% of a day's wage. And what I argue in the book there, Matt, is that Jesus, first of all, is talking about a post-mortem prison, that he's not only talking about an earthly prison, although it could be applied to an earthly prison, but given the immediate and and wider context of the passage, I argue that he's talking about a post-mortem prison. And I also argue that the prison is not 
eternal, but it's temporary, uh, especially in light of the fact that you don't have Jesus giving any indication that it is an eternal debt to pay like he does in Matthew 18 with the unforgiving servant who owed 10,000 talents, which is equivalent to roughly over 164,000 years of daily wages. Wow. That's an unpayable debt, and Jesus specifies that. He gives no such indication that the debt in Matthew 5, 25 through 26, is unpayable. And then secondly, when you take into consideration, Matt, that in the ancient world there were no lifelong prisons. That was not economically right. smart, right? They just didn't have the resources to take care of a person in prison for the rest of their lives. So they were either, either judged to be innocent and let go or they were judged to be guilty and they were executed. So when you take all of that into consideration, and especially too, I mean, Jesus uses that Greek word, uh, Matthew uses the Greek word chondrontes there, less than 2% of a day's wage, seems to imply that this is a payable debt. And Jesus says you will not, he will not get out until he pays the last penny. And given all of that other evidence, we can mm. read this statement until you pay, as implying a change after that select period of payment is completed. Yeah, that's really good. I, so that's I, one passage. Yeah, because I mean, even the general principles that you laid out is still a biblical argument. Like it's rooted in scripture. I think I first heard Jimmy Aiken making the argument, you know, there are those who will be saved, who at the moment of their death are either sinning or are attached to sin. Premise right. two, you know, there, there will be no sin in heaven nor no attachment to sin. Therefore, there has to be some intermediate state that purifies us from those attachments and wounds from sin, and that's right. what the church means by purgatory. That's basically it. And then, of course, you could get into the question of exactly what are those remnants of sin, right? So you have, obviously, a defilement of sin that if it's not taken care of by an act of contrition before death, it's going to have to get taken care of in the afterlife. And then you go on to inquire as to what are these other remnants of sin. The church articulates one being an unhealthy attachment to a created good, and then the other being the debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin. And that's the thorny issue, right? Mm, that yeah. debt of temporal punishment is an aspect of purgatory that most of our Protestant brothers and sisters and even Orthodox Christians are going to reject and have a problem with. This idea of expiating for sin in this postmortem state of existence. Yeah. And although it's interesting, Matt, uh, Leibniz, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz yeah. actually affirmed purgatory, and his argument for purgatory was from divine justice. <laughs> huh. And he emphasized the temporal punishment aspect of purgatory. So there is an interesting diver diversity of views uh, of, among non-Catholic yeah. Um, Christians, both Orthodox and Protestants. I'm encountering that as well. I recently interviewed uh, Cameron Batuzzi on my channel, who's a Protestant, and he can get behind the purification model. The maybe sanctification not model. Sanctification right? model. Maybe not the expiation yeah. or whatever Correct. you call it model. We can get to that in a satisfaction moment. Satisfaction model. Yeah. Satisfaction model. Okay. I'd like to get that to that in a moment because I do think that's interesting. Uh, but just real quickly before we do get to that, I mean, there are still those who say, yes, but Jesus never said the word purgatory, or there's no explicit reference to it from Christ. Christ, his lips, or maybe even the apostles. Uh, what do you say yeah. to that? Well, I mean, if you're looking for the word purgatory, you're not going to find it, but it would be absurd to in imply or infer from that that purgatory is not present in the Bible because obviously, you know, the, the common stock response to that is the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's a good response. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's true. The word is not there. So the question is not whether the word is there. The question is, is the reality that the word expresses or connotes there? That's what we're looking for. And so I, as I argue in my book, yes, the answer is yes, the reality is there. Whether we're looking at the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5, 25 through 26, or even Matthew 12, 32, where he says, the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age, nor in the age to come. The age to come, referring to the afterlife, the implication being that some sins can be forgiven there. And then 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, that's where Paul says that a Christian on the day of judgment is going to have his works tested by fire. The Christian's going to suffer loss if he has some bad works represented by the wood, hay, and straw. But he's going to be saved only as through fire, suggesting that the Christian, the fire is used as an instrument by which the Christian is saved. Whether you take that fire literally or metaphorically, 
the reality is purification. That's what the image of the fire connotes, and that the Christian is undergoing this purification in a postmortem state of existence, neither heaven nor hell. And so the bottom line in response to that objection, Matt, is that, listen, if we can't infer Christian doctrine from certain principles and things that are revealed in sacred scripture, well, then you're going to have to reject the Trinity, mm. right? You're going to have to reject— and the Bible. Yeah, amen to that, because you know. nowhere does it say Mark's gospel is inspired by God. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then you're going to have to reject Jesus' divinity. I mean, think about it, Matt. We all know that for centuries the early church was debating— the divinity of Jesus. You have some texts that speak of his humanity, you have some texts speaking of his divinity, and then it would take time for the Church to unpack that and come up with the hypostatic union, right? That these two natures are joined in the one hypostasis, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, namely Jesus Christ. That's an inference from Scripture. Given certain revealed truths that you put together and you come up with this synthesis concerning a reality. And the same thing applies for purgatory. And so for anybody, any Christian who has a problem with inferring the doctrine of purgatory from sacred scripture, they're going to have to have a problem with the hypostatic union. And I don't think they want to have a problem with that. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, before we get on to the... Um, let, let me just get these two models straight, because I keep saying different words for them. You have the sanctification model and the satisfaction model. Is that what you call them? Yeah, that's that's one way of parsing them out. That's what you find in the literature, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. I like that. Um, before we get to that, uh, church fathers, did you, did you look into or did you explore in your book what the earliest Christians believed about purgatory? Yeah, I did. So I, I survey uh, a, f a few of the early Christian sources, obviously due to the limitations of the scope and the space of the book and the purpose of the book. I wasn't able to go into great detail beyond a simple survey of highlighting enough evidence that these early Christians believed in some postmortem state of existence that matches up with what we today call purgatory and what the church has defined as purgatory throughout the century. So what I do in uh, the chapter on the early Christian testimony of purgatory is I did, I when we go through the evidence, you find two themes or motifs that suggest or reveal that these early Christians believed in something akin to purgatory. So you have prayers for the dead, and you have early Christian gravesite inscriptions requesting prayers for the departed dating back to AD 150. You have prayers for the dead in you know Cyprian of Carthage, Cyril of Jerusalem, mm. of course, Augustine. But you also find the motif of a postmortem purgation and temporal punishment. We find that as early as AD 200 in Clement of Alexandria. You also have hints of it in uh, when Perpetua Perpetua describes her vision of her brother Dinocrates. Hmm. There's a, a hint of postmortem uh, expiation for sin, even and that's about AD 203. So you had the beginning of the third century there. And then I look at St. Cyprian of Carthage, Lactantius, and then a couple of Greek fathers as well, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil the Great. Gregory of Nyssa is explicit with regard to a purifying fire, but that's sort of a questionable uh, reference for our Orthodox friends, and especially the Greeks in the debates in the city of Ferrara uh, prior to in the first session of the Council of Florence, eventually end up in Florence where they have a problem with St. Gregory of Nyssa because it seems in his writings he adopts Origen's view of apocatastasis, where all will be saved, including the demons, at the end of time. And so because Gregory of Nyssa's purifying fire is sort of attached to uh -huh. this yes. heretic, which would eventually become a heretical position, not at the time Gregory of Nyssa is writing, I might add, they have a tendency to disregard or dismiss Gregory of Nyssa's passage where he speaks of a purifying fire. However, what's interesting is that in Basil the Great, Matt, Basil the Great, in some of his writings, he speaks of these noble athletes of God, right, who die, and he speaks of those souls who are found with wounds from their wrestling, quote, any stains or effects of sin, and they are detained, and he contrasts these athletes of God with those who die without stain, and they go and they're brought by Christ immediately into their rest. But what's interesting here is Basil the Great says, okay, some souls die with stains or effects of sin, 
And these are noble athletes of God. So these are not damned souls. And he's contrasting this with soul, these souls with souls who immediately go into their arrest. And so what I argue in my book is that the implication, first of all, the implication here is that these stains or effects of sin are eventually going to get taken care of for these souls. They're eventually going to be purified, purged. Obviously, there's no fire mentioned. There's no, the nature of that purification is not mentioned. But that there are stains or effects of sin, and the implication being that such effects of sin will be taken care of before these souls enter into their completed rest, implies that Basil the Great believed in some post-mortem purification, some post-mortem state of purification. And I might even add, Matt, that notice he says any stains or effects of sin. And so that actually brings up the question, well, what are the effects of sin, right? Hmm. And so he doesn't specify in this passage what they are, but as I argue in my book, I think we can make a good argument that such an effect of sin would be debt of temporal punishment, right? To incur some temporal punishment due for sin. So even though it's not there explicitly, it may very well be there implied. But of course, when looking at these early Christian sources, you're not going to find a full-blown right. articulation of the doctrine in any one passage. Right. It's a matter of looking at the sources, seeing what they say about the afterlife, and putting them together and, 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 and come out with a picture of this postmortem state of existence by pulling from all of the different sources, both Greek and and Latin. And if you're going to refine your sources only to Greek sources, well, then of course you're going to have a problem. You're not going to come out with the full blown Catholic doctrine of purgatory and all of its different aspects because you're restricting your data source. It's kind of like scientism, right? It's kind of like modern day atheists who restrict their knowledge of mm -hmm. the world only to contemporary scientific evidence, to empirical evidence, not allowing evidence that goes beyond the empirical boundaries to determine your knowledge of the world, of reality. Similarly, you find this uh, in the debates about purgatory, where some will restrict their early sources only to the Greek fathers, not looking at the Latin fathers and the fathers of the West who do speak of a postmortem temporary state of purgation and purification. So those are a few thoughts on that. That's really excellent. Helpful. Thanks so much. I mean, at the very least, what this shows is that purgatory is not some medieval invention that the church concocted to make money through the sale of indulgences or something. You know, you, have to, con you have to concede. That the That's right. The earliest there... Christians, as you say, both seem to imply this this existence prior to heaven. And, and there's also the prayers uh, for the dead, which That's wouldn't right. seem to make sense if your only options were heaven and hell. I have a question for you. Um, I think sometimes the way heaven is depicted becomes a stumbling block for people believing in heaven at all. When I was a kid, I remember seeing this cartoonish book and it was like this red, orange, cloudy place with sheep on the clouds and there was a golden gate. You know, like suppose that's what I came to think of heaven as. I could see someone being like, okay, well, that, that's obviously not true. So heaven's not true. So I guess my question is, you know, what do we actually know as Catholics about purgatory that may not necessarily come from some individual saint's private revelation or depiction of purgatory? And do you think some of those depictions of purgatory can be uh, unnecessary stumbling blocks as people consider the reality of purgatory? Amen. Spot on, Matt. One in particular would be the traditional view of the purgatorial fire as being a corporeal fire, a real material fire. That is not a part of official church teaching. So if you got a problem with that, you don't have to accept it, right? Mm. Is it a part of the theological tradition? Yes. Have some of the greatest minds in the church's history affirmed a corporeal fire in purgatory? Yes. Are there ways of getting around some of the obstacles metaphysically concerning a corporeal fire detaining a purely spiritual creature? Yes, I, I think St. Thomas Aquinas succeeds in meeting those objections. And I think he provides reasonable arguments that could le at least give one reason to think there may be a corporeal fire. But that's not a part of official church teaching. So if you have a problem with that, <laughs> you don't have to accept that. In fact, at the Council of Florence, whenever purgatory was elevated to a level of infallibility and its reality was defined, the council intentionally left out the, the imagery of fire or the mentioning of a purgatorial fire, 
Why? Because the Greeks with whom the Latins were debating at the time had a problem with that. And so the church in her wisdom judged, well, this is not essential to the doctrine, Mm. and so this is not something essentially that you have to accept. But that there is uh, punishments due for past forgiven sins and a, a purgation and sanctification, yes, that's essential. So what I do in my book, Matt, is actually at the end of the, the section on the magisterium and the chapter where I give a magisterial survey of purgatory, and the conclusion, I kind of give a list of the essential things that the church has put forward concerning the doctrine of purgatory. And anything beyond those boundaries, you're going to be in the realm of speculative theology, which I deal with in mm-hmm. the last, I think it's the last chapter of my book, when I'm thinking through the theology of purgatory. Some of those things or speculative in nature. And so if a Protestant or even a Catholic has a problem with some of those speculative matters, then they're not going to be in any sort of bad position relative to their their standing with the church. Mm, yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked about a little bit about the sanctification model. It's the idea that purgatory is the final rush of our sanctification. Um, the satisfaction model. Could you kind of talk about that a little bit and why why we should accept it, what that means, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I guess you could parse it out like this. The sanctification model generally is going to refer to just the general idea that the soul has not achieved the holiness necessary to achieve heaven, and so purgatory is going to take care of that by removing any remaining defilement on the soul due to forgiven, uh, unforgiven venial sin, unrepented v- of venial sin, and any unhealthy attachments to created goods. And so those two aspects of the final purification can sort of be lumped under the sanctification model. The satisfaction model pertains to that other aspect of the Catholic doctrine of purgatory, which I argue is enshrined in official infallible church teaching, namely the discharging of any remaining debt of temporal punishment due for past forgiven sin, whether mortal or venial. And so, of course, that's going to presuppose that there is such a thing Mm. for a Christian to incur a debt of temporal punishment due for sin, okay? If that is the case, then it would follow from that that if such debt of temporal punishment is not fully discharged in this life, well, then it would have to be discharged in the afterlife before entrance into the beatific, beatific vision because you can't enter into the beatific vision having some sorrow, displeasure, or suffering due to you. Because heaven not only precludes the factuality of suffering, the fact of suffering, but also having any suffering due to the individual. Mm. So it all depends upon that that premise in the argument that there is such a thing as a debt of temporal punishment due for sin. If we can affirm that, then it would follow that such debt would have to be discharged if not fully discharged in this life. And of course, this is where penance comes in, right? The purpose of penance, subsequent to receiving absolution and confession, is to, and throughout the Christian life, is to work toward discharging that any remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin. And if not fully done in this life, then subsequent uh, after death in the next life before entrance into heaven. So, that aspect of purgatory is what most identify as the satisfaction model. Although it's a bit misleading, Matt, because the souls in purgatory do not engage in quote unquote satisfaction. Rather, the tradition refers to it as satispatio, satispassion, because the suffering that they endure is entirely passive. They are doing nothing themselves. Mm to discharge the remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin, but the suffering is entirely undergone in a passive way. Now, this brings up the question, I'll I'll shut up after this and we can get on here, but this is interesting. And I point this out in my book. This brings up the question, okay, well, what is the nature of that suffering, number one, but also what is the means by which the soul suffers? Does the soul suffer simply as a negative consequence from being purged of the unhealthy attachments to created goods? Or does the soul suffer by way of a positive infliction of suffering upon the soul by God? Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in its presentation of purgatory and the purgation of of unhealthy attachments to created goods, 
seems to favor the first model, and that is by way of the unhealthy attachments to created goods being purged, that is a means by which the soul discharges any debt of temporal punishment. But it never excludes the other option, namely that God could impose positively suffering upon the soul to discharge any debt of temporal punishment. It affirms one without exclusion of the other. You find the other in the theological tradition, where mm. God positively inflicts suffering upon the soul. So depending on you know where you fall, I, I argue that it could be both and as far as the means by which the soul suffers and discharges any remaining debt of temporal punishment. So those are two other aspects with, uh, related to the satisfaction model that are important to think through and articulate. Okay, that that's that's super helpful. Thanks a lot, Carlo. All right, before we go any further, we're going to take some questions here from patrons and and those super chatters here. I want to say thanks to Ethos Logos Investments. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when people talk about investing, I get terrified because I'm aware that there's something that I probably should be doing as a responsible human being that I'm not doing. Um, but you don't need to feel that way anymore because Ethos Logos Investments is here for you. In the pastoral letter, Economic Justice for All, the USCCB states that invested funds must be used responsibly because a Christian's stewardship embraces broader moral concerns. Stewardship means making wise financially prudent decisions, but also avoiding profiting from evils like pornography, uh, abortifacients, uh, stem cell research, uh, human trafficking, uh, these sorts of things. But what is a Catholic to do? Investing is already complicated enough. Well, that's why I'm so pleased to introduce you to Ethos Logos Investments. Their mission is to enable Catholics to invest according to their faith, values, and morals. They even have 401k plans with portfolios that adhere to the USCCB's responsible investing guidelines. So head over to elinvestments.net slash pints to learn more and get started today. That's elinvestments.net slash pints. There is a link in the description below that you can click and you can watch a little three-minute clip that I did with the founder. Head over there and uh, Ethos Logos Investments can help you invest with character. Securities offered through Securities American Inc. Member FINRA, SIPIC, Ethos Logos Investments and Securities America are separate, uh, separate entities. With that said, let's start to take some questions here. We have a super chat here from Common Sense Culture. Thanks so much. He says, Glory to Jesus Christ. Will you please Amen. interview an Orthodox priest about orthodoxy? You do a great job of this with Protestants, but only talk to Catholics on here about Eastern Orthodoxy. Father Josiah Trenum would be a great candidate or Father Stephen Day Young. I'm open to the possibility. The reason I've interviewed Protestants more than Eastern Orthodox is that these Protestants are like very close friends with me and I know them and so we chat together. Um, I'm open to hosting a debate, as I've said multiple times here at Pints with Aquinas. If you know of an Eastern Orthodox that's reputable, that would be happy to engage in a debate with a Catholic apologist, I would love to have that. It could be a friendly, beautiful discussion where uh, Eastern Orthodox and, and Catholics who have so much in common could sit down and discuss what still divides them. So if you know someone like that, write to my assistant, uh, Melanie. Uh, email is assistant at mattfrad.com. Uh, that, that would be great. Okay, here's a question. What's the difference between limbo and purgatory, someone wants to know? Yeah, well, it depends on which limbo you're referring to. So if you're referring to the limbo of the fathers concerning the abode of the dead and Sheol prior to the ascension of Christ, that would be a reference to the abode of the souls of, say, Abraham, David, and Adam, and Eve, right? Uh, understanding that they repented of their fall. And all of the Old Testament righteous souls listed in Hebrews chapter 11, that's referred to the limbo of the fathers, it has similarity to purgatory in as much as it's a post-mortem state of existence, neither heaven nor hell. But such a state of existence would not entail any form of suffering and purgation. Whether those souls receive their purgation at the particular judgment when they die, or whether those souls receive pur purgation prior to the ascension of Christ, uh, there's there, we just don't we don't have any official teaching on that. Uh, any soul that would die with the need of purgation would have to undergo it. I suspect it would happen when they die at their particular judgment, and that the abode of the dead or Sheol would be a, a, a Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort as they await their Messiah. 
uh, that Jesus, uh, these souls to whom Jesus actually does go and preach according to 1 Peter 3.19. That's how I read that passage. And that these souls would uh, enter into the beatific vision upon Christ's ascension. So that's the limbo of the fathers. Now, limbo of children, that is a, that refers to a postmortem state of dwelling or existence for those souls of children who died without baptism. That was seems to be in the tradition when you look in the history of church teaching on limbo. There is strong evidence that it was a part of the ordinary magisterium, not infallible, but a part of the ordinary magisterium. And there's some debate today, Matt, as to whether the limbo of the children idea is still a part of the ordinary magisterium or if it's been reduced to mere theological opinion. Okay. I don't really have a dog in that fight. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I need to do some more research on that. But that would be distinguished from purgatory because such a place of dwelling would not uh, involve any form of uh, suffering or expiation for sin like purgatory would, although it would entail uh, a deprivation of the beatific vision uh, but I don't think we would affirm that such a state of existence would imply a form of suffering on their behalf because God could provide for some uh, for them in a natural state of bliss. Okay. So that's it. That's once again, that's something that we're in the speculative realm concerning the nature of that dwelling place. And so there's a lot of details there that we're not going to have to accept that such a place exists. That's even something that there's debate about whether or not a Catholic is obliged to assent to or at least give religious su submission mm -hmm. of intellect and will. The catechism simply says, with regard to those children who die without baptism, we have good reason to hope in God's mercy. Uh, so it neither affirms nor denies. We have reason to hope that such children would receive the graces of baptism and immediately go into the beatific vision. This next question comes from Ryan Casey. He's one of my patrons here, and it looks like he's asking this question for somebody else. Why don't Orthodox Christians believe in purgatory if that is obviously in church tradition? Yes, very good question. This is kind of a complicated issue. Uh, it's one of those things that, Matt, I wish I would have had more time to research and use more of the material, put more material in the book. But due to the limitations of the scope of my book, I couldn't get into sort of the debates uh, concerning the Orthodox and the Catholic views. So what I do do is I show that there is an original given, that the faithful on earth can assist the departed souls, okay? There's also common ground with Orthodox Christians in that there is a belief that sins can be remitted in the afterlife. There is a post-mortem remission of sins and that our prayers can assist them. And this is pretty obvious in the Jewish tradition for sure, that both Orthodox and Catholics look to in 2 Maccabees chapter 12. I mean, that's a part of the Jewish tradition in offering prayers for the remission of sins of their fallen comrades, their deported souls. Where you're going to have a divergence is with regard to the idea of punitive suffering in purgatory. This idea of a temporary expiation for sin by quote-unquote purgatorial fire. That's where you're going to have a divergence, especially in the debates between the Greeks and the Latins in Ferrara in the first session of the Council of Florence, where they denied or rejected this idea of temporary expiation for sin by purgatorial fire, one, because they didn't find it in their Greek fathers, and two, because they were hesitant to affirm that because the purgatorial fire, the purifying fire, was so intrinsically connected with Origen's view of apocatastasis, of this idea of a purifying fire through which every soul, including the demons, uh, every rational creature goes through and eventually is saved. And so for those two reasons, they rejected the Latin's view of temporary expiation for sins by purgatorial fire. Now, in response to that, my first thought is, well, if you're hung up with the fire part, well, then there's no need to be hung up with that because that didn't find its way mm -hmm. into official church teaching. Now, if you are hung up with the temporary expiation for sin and at least the idea of a postmortem debt of temporal punishment due for sin, well, then that's where the debate's going to lie. Okay. That's where we're going to have to go back and forth in our conversation. But those are sort of the two fundamental reasons why the Greeks were rejecting 
the Latin's articulation of purgatory in those debates at the first session of the Council of Florence. And then it gets a little bit more complicated and nuanced as you go further in, into the discussion. But those, I think that suffices to make a general comment there. And I might might add one last thing, Matt. I, I personally, um, I have a problem with restricting our source of early Christian testimony only to the Greek fathers. Like, yeah. It is true that when you restrict your sources only to the Greek fathers, you're not going to find the mention of a postmortem purgatorial, quote unquote, fire, right. nor do you find, except in Gregory of Nyssa, of course, which they yes. d dismiss and don't take any, uh, don't give any weight to it. And you're not going to, outside of Gregory of Nyssa, you're not going to find the postmortem purgation or the idea of temporal punishment. But why restrict your early Christian sources yeah. only to the Greek fathers? You have other Christians as well that we can look to who did affirm this postmortem purgation. And I think, Matt, this ultimately leads us to the question, well, who's to say which is right, right? Yes, there and, you go. There and you and go. so we need that voice. We are not, we are not left merely to a battling out amongst the church fathers to To be know, tossed to and score. fro yeah, with yeah. every wind of doctrine. This is why Jesus gave us the magisterium to settle these issues for us. Yeah, and then, of course, like I'm sure in the Eastern Fathers, you're going to find uh, prayers to the saints being recommended. And this is, of course, not prayers to the saints, I beg your pardon, prayers for the deceased. And this is something right. that Eastern Orthodox do engage in, and it would seem And that's an original difficult. given, correct. Yeah, yeah, it would seem difficult and, you know, to justify why you're doing that unless there was some sense in which you're... I might, I might add this, too, Matt. I point this out in my book. It is interesting that the Eastern Orthodox Synod of Jerusalem in 1672 declared that souls in the postmortem intermediate state do undergo temporary punishments for sin. So you have some Orthodox denying postmortem temporary punishment for sin, other Orthodox affirming it. Hmm. And so there is a divergence of views concerning the condition of the souls, although it's universal that our prayers can assist them, and they're in this intermediate state that's neither heaven nor hell. But there is diversity of opinion as to the condition of the souls and what those souls are undergoing, even among Orthodox. And of course, you have the aerial toll houses. Yeah. <laughs> that even goes beyond what the West will say, right? Aquinas himself would deny that demons are tormenting the souls in purgatory. Hmm. The aerial houses seem to uh, go beyond what even Aquinas was even to assert concerning the suffering in purgatory. Now, granted, not all Orthodox Christians are going to affirm the aerial toll houses, but some do, some deny it. So once again, you have a diversity of opinions. Thank you. This question comes from Gershwin. He says, does Carlo use 1 Corinthians 3 verses 14, 15 as biblical proof of purgatory? If so, how does he make sense of it? When I read chapter 3, it's not clear what the works are that are being burned up. As you respond to this, Carlo, maybe remind us and our listeners what that what 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 is speaking about. Yes. Yeah, so in 1 Corinthians 3, we start with verse 11, really. In verse 11, um, St. Paul says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest. So you're talking about building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ for the day, which is the day of judgment, will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire. The fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So the question had to do with the work. So the works have to do with building up upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, of building up the life of faith and the, the Christian life itself. Now, within the original context, it's referring specifically to ministers who are building up local churches, right, on the foundation laid by others, Jesus Christ, and then other ministers coming and building up those local churches in their ministry. But what's important, as I point out in my book, to point out is that Paul does not only envision ministers as builders up of the church, he also envisions other Christians, all Christians, as being builders in some way. So you have teachers and prophets who are building up the church, I think in Ephesians chapter 4. You also have Paul elsewhere in his writings. I, I cite them in the book where he speaks of Christians generally building up the church of God. 
So we all participate in building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, the works he articulates are represented by gold, silver, precious stones. Of course, that would be good works, right? Good things that the Christian is doing to build up the church of God. The wood, hay, and straw would be bad things that the Christian is doing and building up the church of God. Now, that can't be mortal sins because Paul says the Christian has built upon the foundation of Jesus. Secondly, Paul says the Christian is going to be saved. So these bad works are something other than mortal sin, works that are not sufficient to merit eternal damnation or eternal punishment, but bad works nevertheless. And these bad works are going to be burned up by the testing of the fire. But notice Paul says that the individual, although suffering loss on account of this wood, hay, and straw or these bad works, the individual is going to be saved only as through fire. Mm. And as I argue in my book, that seems to be suggesting that fire is a means by which the Christian is being saved. So not only the works go through the fire and are purged or purified, but also the Christian, the builder, is going through the fire. And consequently, we can infer from that, given the motif of fire connoting the the reality of purification, that the builder himself is being purified. And that makes perfect sense metaphysically, right, Matt? Because works flow from our free will, right? What we do determines our character. Mm. And so if Paul is describing the works as being purged or burned up, well, and going through the fire, well, then we can infer from that that the individual whose works they are is being purged and purified by the fire as well, which Paul explicitly states. You will be saved, but only as through fire. All right, thank you. This next qu question comes from patron Edward Chandler. And this is a little bit of a long one, but it's I think he's getting to something that's really important. He says, maybe this is more of a general question about the soul, but how does the soul experience purgatory? For example, is the soul experiencing purification in time, or is it just a logical sequence, like the angels experience things? Or how can a soul in purgatory appear to a living person when in uh, you know, quotes, purgatory. I know souls right. are not extended or material, but they can obviously operate on not just all space, but a specific part of space, maybe coalescing the air to form a body like Aquinas theorizes angels do, uh, and time, since they are sometimes allowed to appear to a specific moment in a specific place after their death. But then are they containing, this is a very great question, isn't it? Do you see how intelligent my patrons are? Um, Amen. I ho hope you're following here because I'm barely holding on but then are they containing that specific space and time like we say demons contain bodies or places they possess i guess i'm just confused about the mechanism of all that and something yeah. like descartes penal gland theory is not satisfactory maybe that's not specific enough to purgatory but thanks if you take the question anyway all right wow okay <laughs> yeah. so let's see if i I should have had a, a pen and a paper there taking <laughs> yeah. notes. I was not. All right. So the first question seemed to be the nature of, quote, unquote, time. How the soul time. experiences purgatory and then having to do and, with time. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So how, the soul, logical duration. how the soul experiences purgatory, if the question has to do as to the nature of the suffering, there's there's a lot of ambiguity here. And we just don't know that in the theological tradition, you do have this idea that perhaps— God activates the sensory powers virtually present in the soul, which do remain by way of divine power, such that the soul experiences sensory pain as if it were united to the body. <laughs> that's, I, I grant it, I'll admit, that's way out there, man. But that's in the tradition. That's an, an option as to how one can make sense of how the soul would suffer. Now, Aquinas would articulate that the corporeal fire detains the soul as our soul is detained by the body now, right? My soul is not like over there with you, Matt. My soul is here as united to my body. So as my corporeal body detains the soul, we can say to one specific geographical location, so too Aquinas argues it's possible by divine power that a corporeal fire could detain a soul and not allow it to go whither it wants, right? Or do what it wants. So those are possible ways that the tradition has articulated how the soul would suffer, okay? Now, as to the duration or the time in purgatory, like he mentioned a successive 
a success, successive experience of right. the pain. Chronological seems, or logical? Yeah, this seems to be in the uh, theological tradition. So for one, as Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI states in Spesalvi and his book on eschatology, we can't measure the quote-unquote time or the experience of the souls in purgatory, nor can we the souls in heaven, in our earthly time. But as the theologians have stated, there is some actualization of potency. There is some succession, right? So they're not absolutely immutable. There is some mutability. Mm -hmm. And so as Lagrange, Garrigou Lagrange points out, it's like a discontinuous time, he labels it. Others have called it a eternity, where you have an instantaneous change. So it's not a progressive change like in corporeal bodies going from A to B in a progressive sense, like an actualized potency not actualized yet. Yeah. But it's it's instantaneous. But nevertheless, a succession of instantaneous changes, a succession of instantaneous moments. That's kind of how Gary Goo okay. describes it. Uh, so you're going to have time in some sense, but it's not going to be the time measured by our earthly time to use the language of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Now, there was one last part of that question cool. that's slipping my mind. Uh, let's see here. He's talking about, I guess, how the souls contain the space in the way oh, that maybe yeah. angels and the do. Apparitions, the yeah. visions, and the apparitions. That is a very tricky in how we're going to articulate. I don't see any problem with God, just as He would allow. It all depends on what's the nature of the apparition, right? Is it like actually the soul present there that is in some way acting in this geographical spatial location and God in some way is permitting a willing, a visible manifestation of this incorporeal, incomplete substance, namely a soul, to be technically correct there? Uh, it's, it's hard to say, right? I mean, it could be God exercising divine power to manipulate the senses in such a way as you see something that objectively is not there, or it could be the soul objectively there acting in that space where God wields by divine power some visible manifestation, right? And so I think there are a variety of ways in which we can articulate uh, that, but how, whether I'm going to land on one explanation or another, I, I simply don't know. <laughs> I, when it comes to apparitions and visions, all I can say is that many saints mm -hmm. and mystics and visionaries had such experiences, and they were real experiences by God, given the verification of the details presented in the apparition or the vision. But as to the metaphysics of yeah. it, and to the nature of it, I can see possible ways of articulating it but whether it. but whether one of the ways is actually how it's happening i'll ask the lord when i get there no I, lo I love this so much because it really does show a humility on part of the church it reminds me of what the catechism of the catholic church has to say about baptism it says something to the effect of the church knows of no other way you know by which men enter relationship with christ it may not use that exact language but except baptism you know, yeah. so I, I just love that. And it, but it says, but but while we're bound to the sacraments, God isn't, and so God could through a means known only to Himself. So in other words, I just love the humility of Catholicism. Like here's what we know right. because it's been revealed to us. Here's what we don't know, but speculation can be made concerning it. I I, I, yeah. I think that's like a mark in the church's favor, really. Yeah. Uh, this, you this, know, one one last thought on that, real quick. Yeah. It's interesting, Aquinas. In the Summa, he denies multi-location. Like, so the idea of bilocation and multi-location <laughs> of this single eye being physically present in multiple places at the same time, he denies that. He says that's metaphysically impossible. Wow. So whenever you have experiences of bilocation of like Pio, he, <laughs> uh, as, my, as I read St. Thomas Aquinas, yeah. articulates it as a visible apparition, right? So uh, that's something that I think you could very kind of throw interesting. into the mix. In that conversation there. Yeah, we got to do an episode called Aquinas versus Bilocation and just hash out all those deets. <laughs> That'd be the clickbait title for it, and then we'd go into it. Here's an interesting question that I think a lot of people have. Maybe I'll get two more questions for you, Carlo. This is the second and last one. It comes from Enrique. Thanks for your super chat. He says, how do indulgences relate to purgatory? Yes, very good question. So indulgences relate to purgatory in as much as an indulgence can achieve that which purgatory achieves, namely the remission of any remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin. And this is why, Matt, I mentioned a while ago that this aspect of purgatory discharging of debt of temporal punishment due for sin 
it's essential to our faith precisely because indulgences is essential to our faith. And indulgence is necessarily or ordered toward the remission of that temporal punishment due to the sinner. Okay? So that's what an indulgence is. It's basically, you know, an activity, an act that the church deems to be worthy, that if done under specific conditions, you're going to either have a partial or plenary remission of remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin. Okay? Now, how that how indul, how indulgences relate that's one way in which indulgences relate to purgatory so get as many indulgences as you can you might die without any remaining debt of temporal punishment all right that inspires the pursuit of holiness because indulgences entail activities that foster intimacy with our lord growth in sanctity and ho or holiness now it also relates to purgatory in as much as an indulgence can be offered or gained for a soul in purgatory. There's going to be a distinction, though, or a difference in how the indulgence is applied to soul in purgatory as opposed to apply application to my own soul, because the church has direct jurisdiction over the souls under her care in this life, but not direct jurisdiction over the souls in purgatory. So when an indulgence is offered for a soul in purgatory, rather than the church directly applying the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints, to the soul in this life and saying, if you do this, you're going to have remission of the temporal punishment. For the souls in purgatory, it's by way of intercession, where the church implores the mercy of God that the treasury of the merits, uh, the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints would be applied to a soul. So it's not direct application, it's indirect by way of intercession. And of course, yes, we can gain an indulgence and offer it for a particular soul imploring God's mercy such that for that soul, that soul would have a, a remission of some or all remaining debt of temporal punishment due for sin. All right. That was excellent. Thank you. i got one more question for you. But before I ask that, I want to remind everybody that we're giving away 10 copies of Carlo's excellent new book, which you don't need to wait to get a free copy, by the way. Like you could just support Catholic Answers and Carlo and the great work they're doing by clicking the link in the description and buying it now. It'll be well worth your time and your money. Uh, but we are giving away 10 copies of this book. And the way that you can be in the running to win this book is by subscribing to this YouTube channel. I've already said we've got 96 plus thousand people subscribed. It would be great to hit the uh, 100,000 subscriber mark soon. So you're to subscribe to the channel and then leave a comment below, not in the live chat, but below in the main comment section. And then next week, we will announce the 10 winners. Okay, Carlo, here's my final question for you. Um, suppose you and I are in a one minute elevator ride. And I say to you, why do you Catholics believe in purgatory? What would you say? Just kind of sum all this up. Well, my first question would be, do you believe in sin? And do you believe in heaven? <laughs> so assuming yes. that you say yes to both of those questions, my next question would be, okay, Matt, do you think you're going to die in such a state that you're going to have no defilement on your soul due to sin whatsoever? Do you gonna, Or do you think you would die in such a state where you have absolute perfection that's needed for entrance into the okay. beatific vision? So let me answer as I think the Protestant might, not all, but one might say, yes, I will, because the righteousness will not be mine, but it will be that of Christ's, which he gives to me. Okay, but the condition of your soul, you still acknowledge that sin incurs a defilement on the condition of your soul. I understand that you have an extrinsic application of the righteousness of Christ okay. that makes you perfect in relationship to your standing before God uh -huh, concerning yes. your eternal salvation. Good, okay. But at the same time, you as my Protestant brother, friend of mine, you also acknowledge that you have to be sanctified. You acknowledge Philippians 1, 6, that what Christ has begun, he will bring to completion. You acknowledge that you have to grow in holiness through your through this life, right? Sure, yes. That's, that's what my, you call my sanctification. Sal my, my salvation is given to me upon accepting Christ. My sanctification is not immediate in the same sense. Okay, sure. all right. So here's, here's the question. Do you think you will achieve such a completed state of sanctification at the moment of death that would allow for you immediate entrance into the beatific vision? I, I don't know. All I know is that... It'll be it'll be Christ who perfects me. Um, okay. All okay, right. What? So that Christ, that Christ who's perfecting you, that can either be totally done at the moment of death, but if not, 
subsequent to death. And okay. if subsequent to death, then that's purgatory. Because as you will agree with me, that no defilement can enter into heaven. So between yes. death and glory, if that perfection has not completed, that perfection must be completed hmm. between death and glory. You did a great job, Carlo. That was fantastic. Thank you, Matt. As we, ra- as we wrap up, how can people learn more about you, get in touch with the great stuff you're putting out there, and, and, and again, this excellent book you've just written? Yes. Yeah, so for the book, they can go to shop.catholic.com. Link, link below. Amazon. There you go. They can go to Amazon, get it at any good Catholic bookstore near you, I suppose. Uh, with regard to my work, they can just follow me at catholic.com. I also have my own website, corlobrusor.com, where it's sort of a single hub where I try my best to host everything that I do at Catholic Answer at Catholic.com because we produce so much content in a day. The stuff that goes live for me gets lost in the feed by the by the end of the day. Uh, so they can follow me in that way. Okay. I don't do the whole Facebook Twitter thing. Good for you. Uh, so so but they can follow my at least the work that I'm producing at Catholic Answers. And um, you're one of the most energetic and convicting speakers in the Catholic world that I've come across. I'm not sure if you're doing a lot of speaking engagements these days, but suppose somebody wanted to book you down the road. Could they book you? How would they do that? Yeah, so they can go to catholicanswerspeakers.com oh. and there's an online inquiry form that will go to our seminar coordinator here or they can just give us a call 619-387-7200 and ask for our seminar coordinator, and she'll get everything rolling for you. Beautiful. Okay, and just a reminder to all those who are watching right now, whether you're watching this live or after the fact, it doesn't matter. We're going to give it about seven days before we announce the 10 winners of Carlo's new book. All you got to do is subscribe to this channel and leave a comment in the main comment section below in order to be in the running. Thanks so much, Carlo. Thank you, Matt. God bless.